Okay, so I am gonna switch away from early stage, early detection, and I'm gonna talk about what happens in advanced stage. So in the past lectures, for those of you who have been coming for a while, I've done a little bit of a review of what's going on. Um, but this year, I thought I would change tack. Uh, over the past six months, maybe, there is at least three new drugs in lung cancer treatment. You can now turn on your TV, and you will see some of those ads running. Um, so I wanted to devote my discussion about these new agents and maybe explain a little bit about what we know and what are some of the myths around these agents, okay? So this first slide gives you a hint of what I'm gonna talk about, which is immunotherapy, which is now what everybody wants to talk about. Now, back in the days when I was much younger, um, and I started my career in lung cancer treatment, I actually was assigned in a big cooperative group to design a study of immunotherapy in lung cancer, okay? So this is now, I hate to tell you how many years ago it was, but the concept of immunotherapy in those days was we're gonna give you drugs to stimulate your immune system to kill the cancer. And so what we did is we put patients through, you know, interleukin-2, interferon, and the idea here is that we're going to turn on those cells. So not surprisingly, uh, the study I ran and the companion study uh, did not show any benefit, okay? And the answer comes down to this. The cancer is smarter than what we were in those days, maybe even what I am now. Um, so, so this diagram is meant to highlight to you how complicated the immune system is, right? So when somebody says to you, I'm going to stimulate your immune system, well, what does that mean? Okay, so, so here you have, is there a pointer? Yes, no, pointer? No, I guess not. Um, all right, so here you have on the top um, right side to you is the lymphocyte, um, and a lot of the focus of immunotherapy treatment is the T cell, right? The T cell, that cell that kills cancer. And then you have on the bottom here is the cancer, right? And I want to point out to you that you have this thing called PDL1 right here. And, and, and the understanding then is that cancer has on its surface this PDL1 receptor or molecule. And what it does is actually turns off your immune response, okay? So your immune cell says, I'm gonna kill that cancer because I recognize it as foreign, and it gets to the cancer, and then it gets shut off. So in fact, in a patient with cancer, mostly the immune system is pretty healthy, and it can recognize the cancer, but then the cancer then turns it off, and after a while, your immune system says, I give up. Okay, so the big change then in immunotherapy today is the understanding that if I give you drugs to stimulate your immune system and I don't do anything about this receptor that blocks your immune system, I get nowhere. And in fact, that's what happened in my early days, right? So now we begin then to think about the cancer in a different way. And so this definition that you see in your slide is we talk about two different types of cancer. And it's a little bit simplistic, I'm sorry, but the cancer cells that are T cell poor and the cancer cells that are T cell inflamed. So you can imagine that if your cancer has in its, in its makeup lots of immune cells, but they're not doing anything, right, but they're still there. If you stimulate those immune cells enough or you block the inhibition, you have a ready-made scenario where they're going to just kill the cancer because they're right there, okay? So this we call the T-cell inflamed tumors, and perhaps these are the ones that tend to respond more to immunotherapy treatment as opposed to the T-cell poor tumors, which have no T-cells in them, so you can't do much with those. Now, interestingly, the T-cell inflamed tumors tend to be in folks with smoking. So, in fact, 
when I stand up here and say smoking is bad, and a lot of the targeted drugs that we've had up until now have been in people who've never smoked, that's all true. Immunotherapy works better in smokers. Okay, I'm not saying people should start smoking, I'm just, that's a fact. And the fact is that because that tumor is inflamed, you've got the elements of the cancer cells, the T cells, and all you need is something then to jumpstart the system, right? So one of the big challenges is how do you turn the T cell poor tumors to, to T cell inflamed tumors without smoking? And that's one of the new challenges that we have. Okay, so now, as, as we... As we have heard, or as we hear, there are actually two drugs, um, now three, that can target the immune response, right? So on the top left side, right side, sorry, is the CTLA-4 and the PD-1, and these are the two receptors or molecules where we have drugs to target. The rest just highlights that there are a lot of different targets that we have identified, but we haven't yet learned how to tap into them, right? And some of those targets can inhibit, some of those targets can stimulate, and so for the next five, 10 years, there's gonna be a lot of work in looking at these newer targets than the ones that we have. Okay, so now, those uh, of us who talk about immune system, you know, immune system is slow, it takes a long time for the immune system to work. If you're gonna get a drug to stimulate your immune system, you gotta give it time. That may be true, but mostly is not true, okay? So in fact, what I put up here is a graph of one of the multiple trials of immunotherapy drugs. And on the left side is this bar graph, right? And the black dots are intended to show when the response was first seen. So if you look at this, you will then immediately see that most responses actually occur early, okay? So in fact, the immune system can work very quickly. It doesn't mean that if it doesn't happen early, it's not gonna happen, but it's, it can work pretty quickly. You also see that on the right hand, uh, on the right hand graph that we have a group of patients with stage four disease, with chemotherapy not working, that are still alive and well beyond two years, okay? So two years doesn't sound like an impressive number, but you know, it is for what we have done so far, all right? So if your immune system works and you can then use it to kill your cancer, you can achieve these long-term successes. Right, so everybody's kind of worried about saying the word cure, um, but I think that you can have really long-term success with immunotherapy, and that's different from any other modalities that we've been using up until now. Now, it doesn't mean the other modalities are bad, but this is the newest stuff, right? Okay, so what are the questions that we have now? So now, as you guys know, there are two drugs that target PD-1. The first one is called Optivo or Nivolimumab, and the second one is called Pembrolizumab or Keytruda, okay? What's the difference? Um, in my opinion, the difference is one is every two weeks and one is every three weeks. They target exactly the same thing, all right? But the question that we face is who responds, okay? Who does respond to immunotherapy? Because clearly not everybody responds to immunotherapy. Can we then identify who is the responder to immunotherapy or not, okay? So, so the field of oncology is whenever you have something that works, you try and find out why it works, right? And why is because if I can tell somebody this drug will work for you 100% of the time, that's better than saying let's try it and see, okay? So then, so then the first thing that, that people are looking at now is the expression of PDL1. I showed you in the first graph that PDL1 is what turns off your immune response. So can the expression of PDL1 predict who's going to respond and who's not going to respond, okay? So without boring you with the data, the answer is maybe. Uh, it tends to, right? So, so in the trial that led to the approval of Optivo, um, nivolumab, there was a look at the tumors with PDL1 expression. And what was seen is if you had the higher the expression, the tendency was that the drug will work better. On the other hand, even if you had a low expression, it could still work. So is it 
the target to look for? Maybe it's not a perfect target, all right? Now, well, what about the other drug, Keytruda? What's the story there? Well, so that's an interesting marketing strategy, okay? Um, so, and this is my take on this. Um, what the company, what Merck did, is they actually looked at only the group of patients that had a high expression of PDL1. And they just treated them with their drug, pembrolizumab or Keytruda. And therefore, they got a higher response rate. So it's actually selecting the better players for their drug, right? So their approval for Keytruda or pembrolizumab is only in patients with greater than 50% expression of PDL1. So you have to then, if you have a patient and you think about that drug, you have to get some tumor cells, you have to biopsy maybe or get an old biopsy, send it out to be checked, and there's one kit that's approved for using, and if it's positive greater than 50%, then you can use the drug. For nivolumab, the Bristol-Myers drug, the approval is independent of PDL status. So what's everybody going to do? Probably going to use the BMS drug, right? So, which is what I've tended to do. But the difference is, one's every two weeks, one's every three weeks, the target the same thing. So when you get people telling you this drug is better than this drug, it's probably not true. All right, so now what we've focused on so far is giving one immunotherapy drug, right? The anti-PD-1. Well, what about cocktails of immunotherapy drugs, okay? So that, I think, is the subject for more work over the next few years. Now, the early hints are that if you combine immunotherapy drugs that work by different ways, you may get a better success, okay? So in, um, we are, what we're doing now is we actually have an open trial here for patients with the first diagnosis of lung cancer, and they either get allocated to get chemotherapy, the standard, immunotherapy with one drug, or immunotherapy with two drugs, right? So, and that's based on a smaller trial that shows that two drugs may be better than one, but more toxic. All right, so I mentioned the word toxicity. Well, what are the side effects of immunotherapy? Well, so contrary to what you might think, immunotherapy can be pretty toxic. Um, if you stimulate your immune system, if you turn it on enough, you may develop things called autoimmune disease, all right? Which means that your immune system then decides, I'm gonna attack a different part of the body. Uh, so one of the common side effects is a skin rash, dermatitis. Uh, everything that ends with itis can be a side effect, right? So there's dermatitis, there's colitis with diarrhea, there's sometimes rarely hepatitis and even more rare inflammation of the lung, pneumonitis. So you can imagine that if you combine immune drugs, you're actually gonna try, and they all have the same side effects, you're gonna probably end up with more side effects related to what I just mentioned. So some of the work that's being done now is to look at immunotherapy cocktails, but it's clear that you can give the same dose as if you would give it as a single agent, right? So. Single agents versus combinations. That's gonna be the work for the next five, 10 years. What about immunotherapy plus chemotherapy? All right, so if you're a naive person like myself, you would think that's a bad combination, right? Chemotherapy suppresses your immune system. Immunotherapy stimulates your immune system. Does that make sense? So intellectually, it probably doesn't make sense. In practice, there's actually some data that, in fact, chemotherapy plus immunotherapy is better than chemotherapy. Uh, and it's better than immunotherapy by itself. Why is that? Well, the thought is that some chemotherapy drugs actually work by stimulating your immune system, right? So now that's very early work and that's gonna need a lot of further investigation, but we are in fact opening a trial here to look at exactly that, where patients with lung cancer will get either chemotherapy or chemo plus immunotherapy. And that's gonna be an exciting thing for us to find out. What about immunotherapy plus radiation therapy, okay? And that's another topic of, so we know that radiation therapy actually can stimulate the production of the PDL1, the target for the immune response. So there's gonna be a lot of work done with that in the future. I recognize some folks here in the audience who've actually been through one of our trials of immunotherapy with radiation therapy with remarkable success. So I think that, you know, the next five to 10 years, I'm gonna be telling you more about uh, what immunotherapy can do. Okay, so of course now, if you have a drug that works well, 
and the approval for immunotherapy actually is what's called a second line setting. You get chemotherapy first, you can get immunotherapy second, second line setting. Well, if it works well in the second line setting, will it work better in the first line setting? And what about people who are at risk after surgery, after Dr. Pass removes the tumor? Would it work well in that setting? Well, I don't know, right? Uh, you would think that the answer would be yes, uh, but again, there are now a couple of trials being run to look at immunotherapy early on in the spectrum of the disease. And theoretically, it might be even a, be a better way than what we're doing now. Okay, so that's immunotherapy, and I know I just blew by it, so I think I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions to discuss. Um, but I wanted also to devote a couple of minutes to talk about the other class of compounds that recently got approved. So I presented this slide before. Um, this is EGFR stands for Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor. And Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor is, was recognized as a target for lung cancer several years, many years ago. Um, it is predominantly, so it's mutated, uh, so it's changed, so it becomes turned on, and that leads to the growth and development of the cancer. And the folks that have the EGFR mutation predominantly tend to be never smokers, women as opposed to men, and uh, folks with Asian derivation um, ethnicity. So the EGFR mutation has been a target now for the past many years. Uh, and there are now three drugs that are on the market that target EGFR. So the first one actually was Tarceva or Lotnib. The second one is Efatnib or Gilotrif. And then the most recent one is a drug called Jafitnib or Aressa. And Aressa is an interesting story if you have time, I can tell you. But it started as being disapproved and it's now finally has become approved. But I wanted to show the slide for a simple reason. Uh, as you can see, the target is present right on the surface of the cell there. And uh, there are other pathways that the cancer cell can have to bypass this inhibition, right? So, so what happens when you take Tarceva or one of those targeted drugs? You know, a lot of the times what happens is you develop, the cancer develops a second mutation and becomes resistant to the Tarceva or, the, or whichever drug you pick, right? But interestingly, the cell is still addicted to the pathway. The EGFR pathway is still intact but the cell is still addicted to it, right? So, so what happened is uh, the most common uh, mechanism of resistance happens here where my arrow is, uh, and that's the development of something called T790M. So T790M happens in at least half the patients uh, that become resistant, and what happens is it's a change of the configuration of the receptors, so the drug, the first drug, Tarceva or Fatim, doesn't bind, right? Well, okay, so now if you can recognize that there is a second mutation, can you target that mutation? And the answer is yes, okay? So this now has a name, um, and it's a long name, and I must say I can't remember it because it was only approved about two weeks ago, I think. Um, so there are two drugs. This one was made by AstraZeneca. I Think of it as 9291, uh, but there's a second drug made by Clovis. Uh, but this is the drug that just recently got approved for folks with T790M mutations. So what happens now is if you have a patient and you have the EGFR mutation, you take the targeted drug for that. If the resistance should develop, then you need to get to find out whether they have the T790M, okay? And how do you find that out? Uh, so now there are two ways to find out. The classic way is you biopsy the tumor again and you send it for analysis again. Although, as Dr. Pass had mentioned, a blood test, right? So there is now a blood test. Um, and there are several companies that offer a blood test that does this next generation sequencing and can see on the blood stick whether you have the T790M. And if you have the T790M, this drug will work just as well as the first drug is, or Lotnib or Jafitnib or whatever, right? So I think now you can see that we've gone from having a first generation EGFR inhibitor, now there's a second generation EGFR inhibitor, and there'll be more coming down the road as we recognize more the mechanisms of resistance, okay? So why didn't I say that immunotherapy should be used in this, in this group? Well, so interestingly, the EGFR mutation patients tend to have 
non-inflamed tumors, right? Why? Because they're never smokers in general. So immunotherapy, whereas it doesn't not work, but it may work less well in this group. So now there's a lot of work looking at combining some of the, it, these inhibitors with immunotherapy and seeing if you can get more, uh, more benefit. So I think I'm going to stop talking here um, because that's all the slides I have. Um, but certainly we'll have questions later. But I wanted to try and just, you know, say that I, I you know, I've been, I've been seeing patients with lung cancer for many, 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 many years. And, and I think that there's such a remarkable change in how we think and how we treat. And I think we are getting to the cure. We are getting to the cure. I know it doesn't come fast enough for me and for many, but we're getting there. And, and I think that I look forward to having you here again next year, listening to what more has been discovered. Uh, so I thank you and uh, I'll move to the next person.